Hey guys, welcome back to Back Pocket Game Reviews, and today we're going to talk about, you guessed it, GameStop. We're going to talk about the EB Games merger and a lot of the stuff that went on there. Um, which, a lot of it's pretty interesting, and this has been a very highly requested video, so I'm happy to finally have done the research and be able to bring this all to you and uh, thankfully a lot of it was me correcting information that I had um, and some of it was information that was validated that I had so uh, by the way for any of you interested in the lame stop shirts I do share, sell them in my teespring store which you can find in the description box down below I also typically tag it on the cards as well um, there are a bunch of other BPGR rated or BPGR branded products that I saw in there as well. But let's go ahead and get started on this. So EB Games was founded in 1977. That might seem like a really long time ago for you when um, we're talking about a game store. But when EB Games was actually starting, it didn't have anything to do with games. It actually was selling digital watches and calculators. Yeah. So EB Games, well. EB, known as Electronics Boutique back then, started off selling digital watches and calculators. Eventually, they expanded a lot of that business, too. So it eventually included TVs and a lot of other electronics. So they were a small electronics store that was typically inside of a mall. Almost like a Sun TV. A lot of you are probably too young to remember style of like that style of store. But they were a smaller scale version of that. They did eventually even get into computers, like hobbyist computers. So then they would have been more of a competitor directly to like Radio Shack at that time. Um, Kenny Drusha Den. Uh, that's that's the founders. Okay, King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. James Kim was the founder. So it was started in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. James Kim was the founder of Electronics Boutique. Um, they eventually moved into PCs and software before even getting into games and didn't really ever even start to scratch games until the very late 80s. So it, it's kind of weird to think of them as just solely a game retailer, but I mean, towards the end of them being here in the U.S., that is all they were. And even over in Canada and Australia, that is mostly all they are there. Um, in the 1990s, they switched fully over to consoles, games, and gadgets. Or no, they switched over to consoles. Games and gadgets was another one of their stores. They owned two other stores, which we'll get into in a second. So they eventually switched over to console games, which I would assume mostly at that time would have been Nintendo and Sega. So those would have been their two big driving forces. They did still carry PC software at that time, but it was a very minimal part of their market. Um... PC software, even in the 90s, just wasn't something... Typically, you went to a computer store. So, Micro Center was a huge deal back then. Um, even, like, the Best Buys and the Circuit Cities. So, EB probably would have never gained too much market share, specifically in computer software sales. Um, they owned two other stores called Games and Gadgets and Brandywine Collectibles, which they both eventually sold off in the 90s. Um, and part of why they sold it off was they eventually went into restructuring the company. And when I say restructuring, it's mostly like a rebranding. Um, they changed the name to EB in 2000. So that, that was kind of a late change. So mostly, I remember it as Electronics Boutique. Like, I remember it pretty vividly as Electronics Boutique. And I think that was one of EB's biggest problems is they had so many stores titled by so many different names um, like when GameStop finally came over to the Players Mall, we had a GameStop upstairs and this was after the EB merger. And then there was something called an EBX downstairs, which was just Electronics Boutique Extreme. That was actually a pretty sweet store. Don't let anyone fool you on that. Um, GameStop shares too, at the time of the merger, were actually valued less than what EBs were. So EB was a more valuable company than what GameStop was at that time. Um, they, they, eventually, they merged in October 6th of 2005. The crazy part is October 6th is my wife's birthday. Illuminati confirmed. X-Files music playing? I'd get flagged so quick for that. Um, so at the time of the purchase... 
Uh, GameStop offered $38.15 a share plus three-fourths of a stock of GameStop to each EB shareholder per share that they had, which is insane. That was a 30% markup on EB's actual value. So, I mean, that still puts them way more valuable than what GameStop was. Um, GameStop shares were at $8.15 a share at the time of the merger. And the crazy part here is just EB could have probably easily turned around and bought GameStop. But it wasn't what they wanted to do. Uh, obviously, they probably saw that it was an industry that was even fading out at that point. Uh, even in the late 2000s, mid-2000s there, digital was kind of starting to become a thing. Especially when you talk like PC-wise, digital already was pretty much a big thing in 2005 for PC. And then the new consoles with the Xbox 360, that was digital was available on that. So they might have seen that as essentially a way to get out of an industry before it eventually bellied up. And I mean, they made a pretty good turnaround profit on that. And that even means that a lot of EB's old shareholders are probably GameStop's bigger conference room board members right now. Um, but GameStop had more available money. That's all it was. They probably even took out a loan from one of their subsidiaries or maybe another company that they were really close to. Took out a loan probably to buy them. But GameStop bought them. Uh, obviously they didn't probably have their money wrapped up into a whole bunch of different other companies, whereas I think EB actually did, uh, such as Brandywine Collectibles and stuff along those lines, because EB did own other stores, GameStop didn't. Um, and a fun fact while I was researching this, Funko Land was GameStop. It was, there was no buyout, they just changed their name to GameStop, which is kind of bizarre, because that's a really big name change. It's not like where Electronics Boutique went to EB Games. That was like a complete rebranding. So maybe GameStop can rebrand themselves and save face and try to stay available in this industry. Uh, it's, it's really weird too, because like back in the day, they had catalog sales for the games. And I was looking through those catalogs and a lot of like the different artwork like the elves and the reindeer appeared on a lot of GameStop's gift cards and stuff and I get it EB is still fully a company they're just a subsidiary of GameStop so over in like Canada and Australia it is EB games they are bringing some GameStops there but EB was actually the bigger one out there uh, that's why they kept the name and kept it as they just moved it out of the states there is no eb in the united states anymore that's why it's all an international company was because eb had a bigger international presence which makes sense seeing as that they were the bigger retailer eb had actually a 24 percent ownership of game at one point they were in a partnership with rhino group and this was back in 1995 it was actually called by a different name at the time. I don't remember. I didn't write it down, evidently. But it was with Rhino Group in 1995. And in 2004, because they were still earning money off of that partnership, in 2004, Rhino Group just bought them out in a giant payout. And, 20, and that's right before the GameStop merger, too. So they had a 24% ownership, went to nothing, uh, and that's when game was created. So that's how game in the UK actually came about was it was part of EB games, which I thought was pretty cool because EB games doesn't really have much of a presence in the UK as much anymore. Um, except for in small parts of like Ireland, if you really want to consider them still a part of the UK, but y you get what I'm saying. Uh, EB Australia was actually founded in 1997 it was the largest game retailer in Australia when it was created. So when EB moved into all of these different countries, they didn't go in there and just be like a small player or a new player in the field. They went in and actually became the way to go in that field. Uh, EB opened in Canada in 1993. That was actually the very first of their international expansion. So, and it's really weird too, because in Canada, like over here, we had the edge card and you had a paid or a free one. Over there, they have like three or four different edge cards and they all are different tiers and stuff. It's pretty crazy and hard to follow. Um, but 
one thing while I was kind of doing a lot of my research here is even GameStop back then didn't really fully suck. Here's the thing you really have to keep into account. Retailers change. Retailers' mantras change, especially as retail has gotten harder. So EB was remembered very fondly. None of us really know how they would have changed with the, broad on, the bring on of Amazon and all these different competitions that they now have that are very hard for retailers to fight. GameStop chose their route. Their route is just very unconsumer, uh, and it, it really is going to do nothing more than hurt them in the long run. They make a lot of very sketchy and bizarre mistakes, to say the least. But you look at a lot of other companies where you look at like a Best Buy and they're like, we'll price match Amazon. We'll do anything to make the sale and to keep your money in our store. That's how a business should be reacting to all of this. And this is that is how a lot of businesses are reacting to it. But then you look at stuff like GameStop and it's really hard to say how EB would have evolved and what EB would have been today if it were still ran by the same people and in America, how it would have really transformed. Because when you look at a lot of the older pictures of EB Games, it's definitely like Americana style store. Like I remember going into stores like these as a kid where EB, their big focus when I was, you know, a couple years old wasn't on games. They did sell them, but it wasn't their main focus. They were kind of like a Radio Shack with a game store. Um, and so it is really weird to see how that stuff has shifted and it's bizarre just because of how well a lot of us remember that stuff and the regards that we take into account. But like back then, price matching wasn't really a thing. Now price matching is commonplace. I mean, Best Buy has like a price match guarantee. Uh, I think I get like 90 days with my Elite Plus Gamers Club stuff to price match. Uh, it's something ridiculous. I have an insane return policy with them due to me being Elite Plus. So, I mean, it's just, it's one of those things that we really don't know what kind of company they would have became. So when we say stuff like, I miss EB Games, EB Games wouldn't be the same company that it was back in 2004 that it is today. And I remember very vividly when they did away with EB Games and when we, they converted everyone from the Edge card to the Power Up Rewards card. That was like right before I had my son. So that would have been like in 2009, 2010. So it... Just kind of keep that in mind is the way we remember it isn't necessarily what that company would have stayed. Uh, and it's unfortunate, but it's very true. I, I hope this kind of shed a little bit of light on it for you guys. Because I, I wrote down all the stuff I really thought was really interesting. And again, I, as I said, I hope GameStop doesn't ever go out of business. I really like ThinkGeek especially. I do think that's going to help power them in the future. Uh, I, I just wish I didn't keep hearing about employees telling me that the circle of life is still very much a thing or now they're getting graded on how much loot they sell if you're wondering what loot is by the way loot would be collectibles so now they're starting to weigh them on collectibles because there's actually a higher profit margin on collectibles than a game you make like five bucks off of a game you probably make all we'll say probably like 60 to 70 percent on most collectibles would probably be your profit margin so I don't know. It, it is really interesting to see. And guys, I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions for me, you can ask them down in the comment box below. And if you haven't already, be sure and subscribe. I have plenty of content that'll be going up all the time, constantly. You guys can check it out whenever you want. Sometimes if you click that bell, it may let you know when I upload. It, it's not a surefire thing. It works almost as well as a Magic 8-Ball. But guys, Thanks for watching. I'll see you all soon. I'll have plenty more coming for you.